I want to conclude this series that we started uh, two weekends ago called Reposition. Everybody say Reposition. See, some of you right now have been in a position of mindset. You've been in a position of perception, position of um, ideas, position of, um, of ready for some type of change to happen. But how many know that change does not happen until you decide to reposition yourself? And you can pray all you want to God and ask him, oh, God, change me. Let me tell you something. God can't change you, but you and God can change together. God will help you through the change. And I really believe that God is setting up the church. When I say the church, I mean the entire body of Christ. We're living in some pretty awesome days. If you just look at our world, there's, I would say, you know, maybe five, ten years ago, there was such a great attack on the church. But we see now today more and more people are coming to know Jesus Christ than ever before. It's the most amazing thing. So God is on the move. God is wanting to move in greater ways, not only in the world, but through every single one of our lives. I believe that God wants to have the greatest move of miracles, the greatest move of breakthroughs, the greatest moves of advancements, of healings, of restorations, of salvations. Maybe some of you have been waiting and believing God for certain family members to come to know your Jesus, right? Some of us have given up on them because we think like, man, they're, they're like the devil. They'll never come to God. Well, let me tell you something. When God wants to move, God will move in a powerful way. But we have to come back to the place where we are positioned in faith. And, we, and when we're ready to reposition, when it's time to reposition our eyes and to fix them and to focus on what God wants to do. And so I love the fact that as a church, we are repositioning this church on Thursday, October 31st, to see the greatest outpouring of God's greatest miracle. And you know what the greatest miracle is? Salvation. We're praying for like a crazy amount of salvations on the 31st. It's going to be amazing. But everybody say this, but God needs Work with me. Eight o'clock was so good. Okay, they were like, they were on it. They were in it to win it. Ready? But God needs, God needs a, clear mind. a clear mind. That's the challenge with so many wonderful people on the earth is that we are so fogged. We are so clogged in our mind, in our thinking. God wants to unfog, unclog. God wants to bring clarity of our mind so that we can reposition because so often the reason that you're not seeing an advancement in your family life, work life, financial life, health life is because we have been stuck in a position of mindset for so long that it hurts to think that I can make a change. It really does hurt. But let me show you a verse in 1 Corinthians 2.16. Let me show you what the scripture says. It says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may what? Man, what's wrong with you 10 o'clockers? Y'all crazy. I've been up since 3, so don't act tired on me. Okay, here we go. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may? Okay, so he's asking a question here. Who has got a revelation of Jesus so that he can instruct you? When we don't know God personally, intimately, it's very hard for us to receive instruction from heaven. When you don't spend time in God's word, when you don't know his word, when you don't know his voice, it's going to be challenging for him to instruct you to reposition yourself or to help you to reposition yourself. So he says, uh, if you know God, then he'll instruct you. If you lack knowing God, then it's going to be to your disadvantage. It's going to be very difficult to instruct you. So he says, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the what? The mind of Christ. Do you really believe that you have the mind of Christ? That's a tough one to believe. Because there's your mind, then there's his. That's why God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. So anything you can think of, God can think higher. Anything, any way that you choose to walk in, God has a better way. And so God's saying, Elevate Church, I want to reposition you to understand that you need the mind of Christ so that I can instruct you in what move you need to make next. Are you guys here this morning? And so I started just kind of talking to the staff. I'm like, okay, guys, where can we go with this last, you know, part of the series? It's part three. And uh, so, you know, we were talking. And then I said, hey, what about... 
What about chess? You know the game chess? Chess is fancy, man. That's like for fancy people. <laughs> chess is for like super smart people. Any chess players out there? Let me see all my checker players. Checkers. See, I'm checkers, man. I'm straight up checkers, man. Let me see all my ghetto people. Checkers. Yes. Yes, checkers. You know, you play me some checkers, man, I will skip and jump three times and the game will be over. You'll be like, what happened? Be like, hey, you lost. So checkers is like my game. You know, it's just, you know, because here's the deal with checkers. Checkers is all about fast moves. Right? Right? Chess? Oh, it's a whole other level. You know what chess does? When you play chess, chess makes you think and then move. Chess is a thought game, not a fast game. And how many know that today as people, we are so quick to move and not think. We don't think. We don't, we don't take a step back and, 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 and realize that, that checkers is something that we most often just live by where we're constantly just making fast moves, where chess is all about a lot of thoughts and and then we move, and it's the most amazing thing. Look at what George Bernard Shaw, this guy was a Nobel Prize winner in literature, said. He said, 2% of people think. 3% of people think they think. <laughs> How many think they think right now? Yeah, amen. And 95% of the people would rather die than think. <laughs> have you? But this is so true. How many of us have ever been in a really bad situation where maybe you're going through some ma major marriage or family or child problems and you're just like man I just don't see how this thing is going to work out God just let me die right now rather than think then think what am I missing what haven't what haven't I asked what haven't I thought who haven't I spoken to and so 95 percent of people would rather die than ever think. You may be facing some major health issues. And instead of believing God, taking God's word, taking him at his word and believing him for a miracle, a breakthrough, whatever it is you need, we, we've, we've and, and I think we've all been there. I've, I've been there where I've been in the hospital, but I'm like, oh God, just take me home because the pain is just so much. But I think there's people here that you're, you may be in, in, in such deep emotional pain that you'd rather just die than to think I can get out of this situation. Are you here today? And so uh, we've heard the whole, you know, uh, common statement from the movie uh, Forrest Gump. Life is like a box of what? Well, I think that life is like a box of chess. Man, life is like a chess game. Every move, every decision you make can either be a great advantage to your life or could be a great disadvantage to your life. It is. Life is like chess. You got to be thinking, man. Look, you don't just move and move. We're so, as I think as, as people, we're, we're, we, we move by how we feel, right? I don't, I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like forgiving that person. I don't feel like serving. I don't feel like giving. I don't feel, and we were led by what we feel when God said, wait a minute. I have given you my mind, the mind of Christ. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who has a brain? A God who thinks. As a matter of fact, let me tell you this. There are three things that you need to know about God right now. Number one, God, he is strategic. You serve a strategic God. God, listen, God has a plan. That's why in Jeremiah 29, 11, God says this. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Aren't you glad that someone has a plan? So often, many of us don't. We don't even have plans. We're just kind of just living every day and just letting the day plan out the day. God's like, no, I'm strategic. God is a strategic God. Let me tell you, the second thing you should know about your God is that God is a detailed God. Think about it. Same thing in Jeremiah. You go to Jeremiah chapter 1, he says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knew the details of you. If you think you're ugly, then you deal with God when you get to heaven. I don't know. But he knew you. You were, listen, he says you were fearfully and wonderfully made. You are who you are because God made you special. If you're a little cray-cray, that's because you haven't renewed your mind. I'm telling you. So stop being the person that says, well, this is who I am. This is how I feel. 
like, stop that. That's what you look like, okay? That's what we all look like. I've been, I used to be that guy, you know, just always complaining, always, and not, not, never, never satisfied until I realized, like, man, Mauricio, you know what? You still have not been born again. You're still the old person. God says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Old things have passed away. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. You are a new, you are my new creation. And so often we stay stuck because we're not willing to renew our mind. We know that information, but listen, but, but information without application is assassination. Just kill yourself all the time. Just jack yourself up for messed up or something like that. So every piece can bring you to an advantage or disadvantage. What's your chess game like right now? Now, I don't play chess. Frank Buard, uh, one of our staff members, was trying to teach me how to play. I'm like, dude, I don't want to play chess. I'm like, just tell me, how does chess work? I didn't care. I'm like, I'm just not that guy. I'm a thinker. I know that if I really applied myself, I know I'd probably be a good chess player because I do. I love to think critically. I love critical thinking. But I just asked him, like, just give me the... Give me the piece names. He says, okay, well, you got pawns, then you got war horses, knights, then you got the bishop, the queen, and the king. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. I can do some of that. All I care about is the king, right? Because the king is the one who wins it, right? And so when you think about chess, it's basically putting an opponent's king in a place called checkmate. Everybody say checkmate. checkmate. And checkmate is the only way to win the game. When you hear your opponent say checkmate, that means that you're a loser. <laughs> it means you lost. It means the game is finished. It means you're finished. It means that it is done. It means let's put the board away. And so it's leaving the king. How does, how does someone win? It's leaving the king unprotected. Okay, so the king should always be protected. Let's just take you. You're, 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 like, you're like the king. But, but if you are living through life and you're not protecting your relationship with God, you're going to lose. If you're not protected, protecting your time with God, you're going to lose. If you're not protecting your prayer life, you're going to lose. If you're not protecting your family life, you're going to lose. We have to protect ourselves from our opponent, our opposition, our adversary our enemy. If not, then you'll just go and live through life and you'll just be frustrated, upset, angry, disappointed, pointing of the finger at everybody, but not realize that, wait a minute, God has positioned me to keep repositioning me to a place of advancement. Are you hearing me today? So let me just show you a, a picture of, of a very famous painting. Everybody say, woo. Okay, so the guy over here on the left represents the devil. The guy over here on the right represents you and me. The person in the middle is the angel of the Lord watching and trying to help you. How many, how many know that God has more wisdom, more counsel, more knowledge, more understanding than you do about your life? But how many also believe that we rarely tap into that wisdom, that counsel, that knowledge, that revelation, because we're trying to do things based on how we feel and not trying to get maturity in the way we think and how we renew this mind. And so the story goes like this, based on this painting, I'm going to read it to you, okay? Here's, there's a guy named Paul Morphy, not Murphy, but Morphy. And he was the world's champion chess player in the 19th century. And one day he was invited by a friend to look at a valuable painting called The Chess Player. In the painting, Satan was represented as playing chess with a young man. The stake being that the young man's soul would be lost. The game had reached the stage where it was the young man's move, but he was checkmated. Everybody say checkmate. He was checkmated. That's why he's got that worry look. His soul was on the line. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like hell is just keeping you in a place of checkmate? You feel like you just don't know. Have you ever woke up like this one morning, not knowing what am I going to do? How am I going to pay that bill? How am I going to? 
How am I going to heal this family? How am I going to, how are my kids going to get off those drugs? How, have you ever been in that place? It's called checkmate. Let's keep reading. Or I'll keep reading. There was no move he could make, which would mean defeat for him. And so the strong feature of the picture was the look of utter despair on the young man's face as he realized that his soul was lost. Paul Morphy said, as he looked at the painting, he said, this is wrong. He said, wrong, wrong, wrong. The painter got it wrong. The king still has one more move. True story. Say that with me. The king still has one more move. Look at your neighbor and say, he still has one more for you. So Morphe, who knew about, who knew more about chess than the artist, aren't you glad that God knows more about you than you? Huh? He knew more about chess than the artist. The artist was just slap sticking something together, thinking he's looking cute. But the guy with, with critical thinking, I mean, Listen, if you and I went to like a place like this, let's say we went to an art gallery, most of us would be like, oh, wow, isn't that pretty? Okay. And then we just go to the next room. <laughs> right? And just, just kind of like whatever. Just, it's not a big deal. Oh, it's so pretty. Oh, look at the red. I like the red. Oh, it's so, yeah. No, but listen, but, but, a, but a kingdom, but a, a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ becomes more proficient in his followership of God than even his own skill set or gifting. And he stands and he just stops and he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. And the whole group of people, they did exactly what I said to you. They all just walked by. But this guy, Morphe, he said, no, no, I'll catch up to you guys. I got to take this in. And he stood there and he studied that picture for a very long time. And he said, the painter got it all wrong. He knew more about chess. He studied the picture for a time. Then he called for a chessboard and pieces, placing them in exactly the same position as they were in the painting. He said, I'll take the young man's place and make the move. Then he made the move which would have set the young man free. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? <laughs> Come on, isn't that what he did when you were deep down, when we were deep down in our deepest, nastiest, perverse sin? When we were at the place of no forgiveness, no redemption, when you and I were at the place of maybe dark places of whether you've been in alcoholism or you've been a drug addict or pornography or you've been someone that was just completely lost out of your mind. But then Jesus, with all of his tender love and compassion and grace, said, hey, I'll take the young man's place. I'll take the young lady's place. I'll take your place. And not only did he take his place, but he took his place and he set the young man free. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. We have to understand this. So one thing we can learn from this story here is play the board, not the player, guys. So often, you know what we do when we're in trouble? We're always looking at the player. Listen, the player is going to deceive you. The player is going to lie to you. The player is going to make you think it is finished. You are done. The player, have you ever played cards? I, I like playing cards. And I always like to make, give people these look. This look like... <laughs> Like, <laughs> and I got nothing. It's bluff. <laughs> Satan plays bluff all the time. Man, he'll stare you down. He'll make you feel like, you know what? You're never coming out of that sin. You're never coming out of that depression. You're never coming out of that anxiety. And you know what we do as fools? We sit there and we're fooled. And we're just like, in other words, we rather believe the enemy than believe what God said. We rather sit there and play with the enemy and forgetting the fact that Jesus has already won. He is 
our victory. He has our victory. His name is victory. His name is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, author and finisher of our faith. That's the king that we serve. And so we get caught up because see what happens is if you're not careful, when we start putting our target on the player, the player, the player, it, it, I tell you, we are so good at arguing with people, fighting people, hating on people, talking about people, and not realizing like, hey, dude, take a step back. Look at the bigger picture. Man, the devil is deceiving you. He, he's making you think that it's all these people, but it's all a part of his plan. Are you here today? So three things to remember. He is strategic. I'm going to give you number three. He is detailed and he is mathematical. That's why when, when, when God says bring the tithe into the storehouse and you start saying they just want my money, see, that's the thief. Yeah, that's not how God thinks. Do you realize that God is the one who started this whole idea of us bringing our offering to him from the book of Genesis all the way through the New Testament? He's mathematical. See, it doesn't add up. God's math will never add up with your math or my math. God's math is supernatural. That's why he says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will man give into your bosom. God, God's math never, when the doctor comes and says, you have cancer, you have these, this many days to live, or these many months to live, this many years to live. I know people in our church that were given that. They were given three months to live, seven months to live, eight months to live, and five, six years later, they're still alive. God's math does not. Listen, he trumps our math here on this earth. And know this, think about this. He already has a plan for you. He knows the plans he has for you. All right, let me show you how, how detailed God is. Psalms 139, you can just listen to me. It's not on the screens. He says, your eyes saw my body even before it was formed. You planned how many days I would live. You wrote down the number of them in your book before I have lived through even one of them. God, your thoughts about me are priceless. No one can possibly add them all up. If I could count them, they would be more than the grains of sand. If I were to fall asleep counting and then wake up, you would still be there with me. That's how detailed God is. That's how mathematical God is. God knows every, God has strategy. God has details about your life. God has all the right math for your life. When your opponent says checkmate, all of heaven responds and say, hell to the no. When the devil shouts or whispers in your ear, checkmate, heaven responds, not today, Satan. How about this? When I say checkmate, you say, not today, Satan. Ready? Checkmate. Now say it with some swag, please. You're just so proper. Not today, Satan. No, come on, ready? Checkmate. Not today, Satan. Come on, doesn't that feel good? Like when you face something, just be like, not today, Satan. No. no ain't, ain't, ain't nobody got time for that. Remember that lady who was interviewed? She said, like, ah, bronchitis. Ain't nobody got time for that. That's, what we, that's how we should be, man. When Satan comes out, ain't nobody got time for that. Not today, Satan. Come on. You need to ask God for strategy. Checkmate is when the king can no longer go forward, backwards, to the left, to the right. It's when the king has been surrounded and the enemy shouts, checkmate. And then we say, not today, Satan. When the checkmate says to us, you're trapped. You're blocked. Have you ever felt blocked in your head? Like you can't even, like, man, there's that whole thing called writer's block, but have you, have you ever had spiritual block? Just dry. You walk in here, just like, okay, everyone's like teary eyed, crying. You're just like, man, I don't feel what they feel, man. You have a spiritual blockage. Checkmate. Trapped. When you feel trapped, when you just feel like, man, I, nothing good's happening. You're trapped with maybe ways of thinking, ways of being. Ways of speaking. You're trapped with your own self when you don't have a chance. Checkmate says you're surrounded by your enemy and there is no escape. Are you hearing me? Because, listen, because the enemy of our soul, you know what it wants to do? It wants to scream in our ears, you're finished. It's useless. Don't try. 
give up. Quit. It's not going to work. Stop trying. You're not smart enough. Hey, listen, you know you're not even serious about your walk with God, so why pray to God? That's checkmate. The enemy will come and just start lying to you, deceiving you. The enemy says you have nowhere else to turn, but heaven always responds, not today. Not today. Heaven's fighting for us. Satan wants to put us in a position that says, what's the use of trying anymore? Let me show you John 10, 10, because here's how Satan moves. You guys ready to see? Listen, you can't win your enemy if you don't know his strategy. Are you ready? Real simple, John 10, 10, because the devil, this is how he plays the game. A thief, this is what Jesus says. He says, a thief has only one thing in, where's the church's mind? <laughs> Let me say it again. The thief only has one thing in. Let me tell you how he thinks when he plays chess. He wants to what? Steal. He wants to slaughter. And he wants to destroy. Okay, so that's how the thief thinks. I'm going to steal from you. I'm going to slaughter you. Then I'm going to destroy you. If you don't know that your adversary thinks this about you, you're not going to win. If not, it's just going to be patty cake church. We just think we go to church, we sing songs, we hear a good message, we laugh. We're like, great message, thanks, pastor, that was awesome. And then we go right back to our reality and then nothing changes. Why? Because the thief has one on you. But look at this. But look what Jesus says. But don't trip, he said. But I have come to give you what? Everything in what? Abundance. More than you expect. Life in its what? Fullness until you what? overflow we should be now don't be thinking all money okay like oh i'm just gonna be blessed no god wants to overflow you with healing god wants to overflow you with joy god wants to overflow you with satisfaction god wants to overflow you with purpose with vision god wants to overflow you with dreams this is what he does so notice that there is an order of how satan moves think about it he the first move he does is what what's the first one he does he comes to what? Steal. What's he going to steal? He's going to steal. First, he's going to steal. He's going to steal your hope. Then your faith. Then your dreams. He's going to come and he's going to steal your passion. And he's going to steal the gifts, the talents. He comes for that. that so that's, that's one move. Then what happens when you get fogged up? When you have no faith? When you have no anchor of hope, what happens? Then he comes for the slaughter. You know what the slaughter looks like? Many of you may be thinking, wow, does he just like kill us physically? Well, it happens too. He does. Sometimes we make the wrong moves and we put ourselves in the wrong position at the wrong place at the wrong time where we should have never been and then things happen. But let me tell you something. The slaughter is you start dying spiritually. It's just kind of like whatever. Your Christianity is whatever. It's really, listen, it's just the necklace of a cross on your, on, your, on your neck. That's all it is. That's what Christianity is today. It's just, it's a fashion. It's, 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 not, it's not real to everybody. And I hate to say this, but it's not real to everybody in this room or, or any of the churches in this valley. It's not real to everybody. And we have to realize that the adversary, the enemy doesn't want us to think. He wants us to feel. And feelings, I don't know about you, but feelings have got me into a lot of trouble. How about you? Feelings have ruined relationships for me. Feelings have got me in predicaments that I really should have been in. And feelings will trip you up. Then he comes, he then comes for the slaughter. He starts killing you spiritually. You're, you start saying things like this, well, I don't feel how they feel. I don't believe the way they believe. Like there was a moment where you felt the presence of God, but now you're just like, I don't even feel that. And then you know what he does? Then he destroys. He comes for the destruction. Do you realize that's what life is like? It's like chess. But one thing I'm always reminded as I think about situations like this, but if God is for me, then who could be against me? 
know, recently I had someone uh, complaining about our church about something. I didn't even know there was something so stupid. And, and you know what they did? They threatened me. Like, first of all, you don't threaten me. They're just threatening. It's like, I felt like, I felt like, like Daniel in the lion's den, just. How many know that the devil, he can't hurt you. He might gum you to death, but he's a gumless Satan, right? He's got no teeth, man. It just, it says that the devil is like a roaring lion. Didn't say the devil is a lion. It's just like. So he's going to threaten you. He's going to stare you down. Right? And so this whole thing came down. And I'm like, what the? He's like, yeah, and I'm going to report you to the city. What the? But, you know, I was like, no, man, you see, the enemy's trying to steal my joy. He's trying to steal my peace. He's trying to steal whatever it is that God. But anyway, so long story short, I had a decision to make. I could either come down to the level of this individual, this person, or I can ask God, God, give me strategy. Mind you, this, it, was, it was so nothing. It was so minute. It would have really just made this person look weird and funny and dumb and everything, the whole thing. So it was like not a big deal. But it was a big deal because you know what? It was taking time away from me. And my time is precious, and I can't get that back. And so I prayed one morning. I'm like, Lord, you know, what do I do? Because I got, you know... Man, I got, I'm loaded. I got all my 411, and uh, I'm, ready to, I'm, I'm ready to go to the council. My son I'm like, you know what? Can someone just deal with this guy? But the Spirit of God, I tell you, you pray for strategy. This is when you know it's God. God said to me, Mauricio, a soft answer turns away wrath. I'm like, damn, why didn't you listen? Like, why, do you, why do you have to go there, man? Like, why do you have to, why do you have to go nice, God? And I did it. So I went to this person, and and I had a soft answer, and I said, hey, here's, here's what we can do, because we care about you. At the end of that, the man repented. See, I could have been playing checkers, but God was calling me to play chess. Some of you right now, you're playing checkers. God's like, come on, it's time to grow up. Renew your mind. You have the mind of Christ. Are you hearing me? When this devil says checkmate, you say what? That was weak. That's okay. <laughs> okay, I'll leave you with this and then let's go home. Fast. Let's move fast. Try not to laugh. We'll just go through, all right? So Moses brings the people of Israel out of Egypt. They're on the run. They're leaving. Freedom. Awesome. God had the right checker piece or chess piece there. Moses, Moses comes, brings them. They're leaving. They're running between mountains on the left, mountains on the right. They think they're finally going out and they're going to be in their complete freedom. But then they come before a place called the Red Sea. Now they are surrounded by the sea. They're surrounded by mountains to the left, mountains to the right, and the enemy Pharaoh is charging behind them. That is what checkmate looks like. See, there are things that you can do that God cannot do for you. Let's start with that. God cannot forgive people for you. That's your choice. God cannot make you choose him. That's your choice. God cannot make you be committed to him. God cannot make you wake up every Sunday to go to church. God, God can't do that for you. You do that for you. God cannot do, God cannot pay your bills. How about that one? Why isn't God paying my bills? Because God doesn't pay bills. No. God says, go to work. I've gifted you. I've talented you. I'll be with you. So there's, there's certain things that God cannot do for you. He cannot. And then there are things that only God can do that you can't do. For example, the doctor say to you, and I remember hearing those words, Mauricio, we're so sorry. There's nothing else we can do. I hate those words. Or you go to the marriage counselor. 
the family counselor and they say, you know what, y'all cray cray. There is nothing else we can do for you. Or you go to the banker, right? You've been believing God for this house and you've been working hard and now you're at the bank and the banker says to you, we're so sorry. Or you're buying a car, we're so sorry. There's nothing else we can do for you. See, the things that God cannot do for us that only we can do, I think we place ourselves in a predicament sometimes of being lazy in our faith. Because the Bible says this. He says, faith without works is what? Dead. So there is a part of me that only I can do that God won't do for me. And he can't do for me. But then there are, there's a part of my life, there are things in my personal life that I cannot do in my own strength, my own wisdom, my own insight, where I need God to step in and God will do for me and God will do for you. Are you here today? So the children of Israel, yeah, give the Lord a hand clap if you're gonna believe that. So the children of Israel, they did all of their part. They, they obeyed Moses, they left Egypt, they're walking through the desert, now they're at the Red Sea and now they're surrounded. They hear checkmate. What does Moses do? He stops and he cries out to God the Father. He says, God, where are you in this? And we know what God does. Look, Exodus 15, 9, 13 says, your enemies bragged. We will chase Israel and we'll catch them. We'll divide up what we take from them. We'll eat them alive. Look at the enemy. We'll pull our swords out. Our powerful hands will destroy them. But you, ever say, but you. I love the butts of God. But you, but you blew with your breath. The Red Sea covered your enemies. They sank like the lead in the mighty waters. Lord, who among the gods is like you? Who is like you? You are majestic and holy. You, your glory fills me with wonder. You do amazing things. You reach out your right hand. Ever say right hand. Come on. God knows when he needs to step into the game and play for you. The earth swallows up your enemies because your love is faithful. You will lead the people you have set free because you are so strong. You will guide them to the holy place where you live. Come on, the children of Israel were surrounded. And you know what they wanted to do? They wanted to surrender. Moses, come on, we'll just go back, man. It's all good. Good try, man. Let's go. You know, it's lunchtime, man. They're serving, you know, pescado frito today or something. You know, and they're just like, let's just go. Let's just yield to them. Let's just say sorry, joke. April Fool's, man. Sorry. That's how we get. When you're surrounded with fear anxiety, depression, when you're surrounded with frustration, you know what? You know what most people do? They surrender to it. They bow down to that king instead of the king of kings. And Moses said, hell to the no. They said checkmate. He said, y'all are getting okay at this, but 8 o'clock was on point, man. It's all right. 12 o'clock is any better. And, and Moses prayed and God just did what? Boom. Opened it up. You know what I love about this verse? He said he just blew on the water, just, and then they crossed over, and then what? Boom, he buried his enemy. Hmm. You can do everything you can, but God will do what you can. Never forget that. Never, never forget that. Let me give you this last thing. Let me give you nine simple things you can do. But first this, Job lost everything. He lost his home, his children all killed. He lost all his money, his wealth. The guy was, man, he was a billionaire in his time. Lost everything, okay? And he's at the place of like, man, he lost his health as well. But look what he says in Job 42, 16, he says, after this, everybody say after this. Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. 
See, some of us have already been the place where you've been at a loss. Maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you've been bankrupt. Maybe you've lost everything. You lost the house. You lost. But there's always an after this with God. Noah was another example. God floods the earth. There was so much sin. He had no choice but to just completely wipe out the earth. And uh, and Noah builds this ark. And uh, and in Genesis 9, 28, uh, 8, it says, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. In other words, Noah lived more life after than he did before. See, maybe after a drug addiction, after alcohol, after divorce, after loss, after pain, after there's going to be an after this and it's going to be better. God will multiply your days. God will multiply your years. God will multiply your joy, but you got to reposition yourself. You have to position yourself and put on the mind of Christ and start seeing with his perspective. Amen. So when you play the chess of life, think this. Ready? Number one, how you start a game determines how you will finish it. Because I know that there's many of us in this church that it's time to reposition our thinking. It really is. So play wisely. Don't be the person that says, oh, I can't wait for 2020. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. Listen, if you can't change on October, what's today's date? The 27th of 2019. You ain't changing 2020. You're lying. You're fooled. You've been deceived. Oh, I can't wait. 2020 is going to be great. But why can't it be great now? Why can't you start now? Number two, don't get pinned. Don't get pinned. Even when you act upon your most wisest, your greatest plan, a decision that you make can bring you so much negative outcome. And so the pieces of your life have to keep moving even when it's not working out. What do I mean by that? You know what? Think about it. Right now, some of you, you need healing, but you're waiting. You're pinned. I'm just waiting on the Lord. No, when you see the 10 leopards, when Jesus said, go and show yourself to the high priest, man, they were like the walking dead, man. Their skin's falling off and, and they're just walking, you know, they're just, they just took God's word. And when they got to the high priest's house and they rang the doorbell, the high priest opened it and they were all clean. Why? They needed a certificate that declared that they were delivered. Don't get pinned. Don't be like, oh, I'm just trying to get better. Then I'll start serving again. Stop it. Don't get pinned. The enemy will pin you. Number three, be flexible. It's a cuss word in church. Listen, it seldom goes the way you planned, but you got to learn how to adjust and continue. If you Listen, if you're part of our staff, our team, oh, you better be flexible. Like there'll be services where I'll be like, I don't like that worship set, change it. Right there on the spot. You know what has to happen? Flexible, adjust. Or, or you're like, oh my God, I'm going to change the song. No, we ain't got time for that. But there's so many Christians just like not flexible, like, hey, we're going to change. We're going to shift. Oh, no, why can't it be the way we used to be? Because it's not. Because we're flexible. Number four, if you're feeling boxed in, free things up. You know what? Here's what I tell box people. Hang out with out-of-the-box people. Just be like, hey, you know what? I feel, I feel boxed, man. I feel like I'm just surviving. I feel like I'm just like bored. Like, what do I got to do? Speak to people who are going to give you God wisdom and help them free things up for you. Number five, ignore meaningless threats. Look at your number and say, keep calm. It's all, tell them it's all good. Amen. The enemy, all he does is give you the stare down. Okay? He just distracts you with those looks. But he's just like, man, ain't nobody got time for that. You just say, that's a meaningless threat. Number six, replace wishful thinking with action. To me, like, oh, I wish I could go back to school. Stop wishing, go back to school. Oh, I wish, I wish I could change my hair, do change it, please. Help us, Jesus. Wow, we're <laughs> we're bored of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I, I, I wish, I wish that one day I can own a house. Stop wishing and start believing. Stop the wish. See, let me show you a picture of what it looks like. See, there's the thinker. Hmm. 
and then there's the doer. Come on, you want to be the guy over here that, yes, I love thinking, but then I do something. Not just sit here, you listen to me, and you leave here, and you're still the same person. You're still, I wonder what he meant. Did he really mean go? Like do something? Yes, I did. Okay, verse, no, verse seven. Number seven, if you lose, do it graciously and try to learn at least one thing. Learn one thing in porn from that lesson. Because listen, if you want to win all the days of your life, then definitely don't get in the fighting ring. Because you're going to have losses, but you're going to have a lot of wins. But learn something. Number eight, look beyond the obvious. Always consider the whole board when deciding on a move. Don't just go by what you feel. Take a step back. Maybe you're offended at people. How about take a step back and be like, dang, it was me. I'm the offended guy. I'm the offended girl. I'm the weirdo. Wow. This whole time I thought they were weird. I'm weird. I'm strange. I need Jesus. Let me get saved again. You know, or something. I don't know. But see the bigger picture. Don't just be narrow-minded narrow always just narrow like this it's like no God's like let's look at the bigger picture don't be narrow focused see what God wants and number number nine very simple enjoy yourself it's so hard for people to do that easy easier said than done enjoy yourself enjoy the journey because here's the reality the rest of your life is chess but you can change you can reposition amen can we give God a big hand clap and say thank you, Lord, for the ability to reposition. Bow your head, close your eyes. Let's go.